a woman came to my house with a notebook and said that she wanted me to tell her my story. A woman came to my house with a notebook and said that she wanted me to tell her my story. A woman in a red coat with a notebook came to my house and said that she wanted me to tell her my story. A woman with a red coat with a green notebook came to my house and said that she wanted me to tell her my story. Said that she wanted me to tell her my story. There are many different kinds of stories to tell, depending on who is telling the story and what kind of details they decide to leave in. If this were a ghost story, for example, we could say that the woman came to my door in the dead of night and knocked loudly as the wind howled outside. She knocked loudly until the neighbors woke up and then she disappeared. If this were a thriller, we could say that in her notebook were government secrets that she, the woman was passing on to me, secrets that could get us both killed. If this were a fairy tale, we could say that the woman rode up to my door and in her red hood and on her white horse we all lived happily ever after but this story is not about the woman who wanted to tell my story this story is about me and i don't just have the one story to tell if this were a fairy tale this is probably the part where i'll tell you that you know at my lowest ebb and with being so desperate and having no hope, something magical happens. And something magical did happen, sort of, you know? My friend said, have you heard of a country called Ireland? Ireland? No. Well, she said, look it up. Okay. But even in fairy tales, you know, things don't happen so easily. There were so many obstacles I had to face before I could go to the embassy and then get a visa so I can actually travel. And even at the embassy, uh, there was more obstacles to face, you know, long queues, uh, papers, no money, more queues. I, I was actually totally unprepared. Um, I've never even, I didn't even know where Ireland was, uh, a part of England, maybe? near London uh, if luckily for me there was I did have some kind of fairy godmother at the embassy he looked at me he was sat behind the desk at the embassy and when I stood in front of him you know panicking with um, all my um, uh, what's a clump of unfilled, unfilled uh, forms I had in my hands he looked at me and he said I reminded him of his wife no, you look just like my wife, he said. You're totally disorganized, just like her. Look at this. You have the wrong passport photos. Look at this. You have the wrong forms filled out. You have no money. He, he had his hands on his head like this. Like, You're just like my wife. <laughs> okay. For some unknowable reason, some strange miraculous reason that to this day I actually don't even understand, he decided to help me. So he was like, uh, here, take this money. Go get yourself some proper photographs. Here's how you fill out the forms. Uh, go to that desk over there. Bring these papers with you. Go to this desk here and get these forms stamped. So when I had all my passport photographs taken and all my forms filled out properly, he brought me to the very top of the queue past all the waiting hundreds, maybe thousands of other waiting people to the very top so that 
I will be first. I will be next. And I will have my visa to go. It maybe it really was a, a kind of fairy tale, you know? Maybe he really was a fairy godmother conjuring passport photographs from pumpkins and visas from trees. And I, a sort of Cinderella. <laughs> I can finally go to the ball. Or Navin. Which is where I ended up. Um, then Port Leash. And then Port Leash again. Where I finally had my three beautiful girls. Mm. The woman who came to my house with her notebook, she didn't exactly say what kind of story she wanted me to tell her. Um, perhaps it wasn't a thriller or a fairy tale she wanted to hear. Maybe a love story, perhaps, kind of romance. Mm. I was born in Nigeria. I was raised by my mother to be a good wife. Um, she helped me to, she taught me how to clean and cook and how to look after my three brothers. My father left when I was 10 years old, so things were hard and money was tight. But if I had, if I found a good husband, I would have a good life. Growing up, I was told that women are like beautiful flowers. The flowers do not last. My mother would be like, mm. do not waste your youth and beauty. Do not throw away God's gifts. You must find a husband while you still can. In my country, finding a husband gives you freedom. It gives you respect. And it gives you a voice. But I already had my own voice. See, why else could I have told the girl with the notebook about my own story? Hmm. But if it is a love story, then I'll tell you about the time that before I got married and got pregnant and left for Ireland, I had had three proposals. Um, the first was by a man. We'll call him Basco Man. He was on his bike. He proposed to me. I was 13. I said no. The second was a Muslim man. And he was looking for his second wife. I was 17. I said no. The third was a man known locally in my area as a kind of drug dealer. Um, he, he made a lot of money. And I was 18. I said no. 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 My mother, uh, she wasn't too pleased with me when I turned down these three romantic proposals. Uh, she was, <laughs> she's raised me to be a good wife, you know? If, actually, if this was about my mother's story, it would certainly be melodrama. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what are you doing, eh? What are you doing turning down these good men? Ah, eh, eh, what, what is this? Eh? Why are you turning down these chances, eh? Are you trying to kill me? Hey, I wasn't trying to kill my mother. Uh, uh, I just, I knew that uh, I just wanted something out there. Something that I haven't yet seen that was out there. And it was a kind of, and it was like romance or at least my broken heart that did lead me to the start of getting a glimpse of this something else. Um, when I was studying, when I finished studying in Nigeria, like everyone else there, uh, I was to spend one year doing free national youth service, you know, to give back to my country. But before I could start the National Youth Service, my first boyfriend broke my heart. Mm. And um, I naturally, like, like anyone dealing with a broken heart, I wanted to get as far away from this boy as I could. So I left Lagos and I traveled north to Abuja, where I managed to get myself a placement in the Central Bank of Nigeria. I had studied, I've trained to be an accountant, but um, for some reason they put me to do the phones instead. Uh, they said they liked my accent. 
What can I say? <laughs> At the Central Bank of Nigeria, there was a woman director, a woman with power, and she was high up in the bank. And she took a shine to me. She said I was friendly and was very good with money. So sometimes she would ask me to go to the marketplace and do her shopping because she knew I would haggle and I would bargain and I would always, always, always bring back some change. I was used to doing this already growing up with my mother when things were hard. Uh, the woman director, she said that I was smart and a, a quick thinker and a hard worker. She eventually would start bringing me to conferences at my work. This made other people jealous. Who does she think she is with her nice accent hmm? and her, and her phoning, uh, phoning people with her nice accent and going to conferences? But I knew who I was, and I knew that someday I could be like the women director. Hmm. Maybe the woman with the notebook who came to my house that day, maybe she wasn't interested in hearing a love story. Maybe she actually wanted me to help her write some kind of uh, self-help book, um, a kind of uh, how to get a job in Ireland if you're not Irish, type of <laughs> self-help book. Because um, what I learned when I started to live in Ireland was that the best way to get a job in Ireland, if you're not Irish, is to just be Irish. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> like, the first year um, I was in Ireland, I applied for job after job after job. Uh, jobs I was qualified for, jobs I was more than qualified for. And they all said the same thing. You need Irish experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a philosophical puzzle now. Eh? <laughs> so in order to have Irish experience, you should get one, you should get experience in Ireland. And that was the one thing that no one would give me. So I decided to get this Irish experience and try and apply for some kind of course. So I applied for a course, uh, insurance broking. Insurance broking. Uh, it was run by Fox. The course was in Pembroke Street. And every day on Pembroke Street, going to and from my bus, I would see these women going up and down going to the bank with their nice skirts and their, and their nice suits, you know. Uh, they looked smart. They, they looked efficient, these women. They looked like they had somewhere to be. And every day when I see these women going to the Bank of Ireland, uh, I know it's silly, but I, I think I like to wear skirts and suits and, and look smart and have somewhere to be. Um, anyway, after my course was finished, um, uh, all the Irish people in my course, they found work placement because they were Irish and had Irish experience. My course tutor, though, he had to make some calls for me, you know, help me find a company that was willing to give me a chance. And... After only two weeks of my work experience, the company that my course tutor had to call, uh, they offered me a job. I was like, hmm. Uh, okay, so actually maybe it was, maybe the woman who, with the notebook who came to my house that day actually, maybe she wanted me to help her write some other kind of self-help book. A, uh, a, a, what the Irish really mean when they say things, type of book. <laughs> because what I discovered when I came to Ireland was that Irish people have a hard time saying no. Uh, where I come from, we say no. I've actually already said no three times to di three different suitors by the time I was 18. And, uh, 
But Irish people, they like to say things like, Ah, sure, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, I'll talk to you later. Ah, yeah, ah, yeah, ah, yeah. They like to say things like, uh, Oh, you must come over for a cup of tea. <laughs> They don't mean you must come over for a cup of tea now <laughs> or ever. <laughs> they just mean, um, I don't know what they mean, actually. I don't know what they mean. Um, there was a lot of these kind of things I had to learn when I was living in Ireland. Um, yeah, quite a lot, there was a lot of things I had to learn because I was different from the people I was already working with. I, I was black. I... Um, I was one of the few people in my company that, in the company that had children, let alone three little girls. There were other things too, like the pub, okay, so, the pub. So in Nigeria, Nigerian women, we don't drink because it's considered a sin. But for the people in Ireland, it's like an extension of the office. <laughs> you know, the, for the people, for the, the Irish people in my workplace, for them, the pub was very important. It helped them to talk. Mm -hmm. Drinking helped them to talk and laugh and and stand and dance on tables. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was very shocked the first time I saw my supervisor dancing on the table. <laughs> hey, in Nigeria, a supervisor would never do that. <laughs> there were other things too. Um, I had I once had a boss called Mary. Uh, now Mary, she she always wore nice suits and jackets, and she had a nice house in the south side. But Mary never seemed so happy. She was always stressed, and she was always busy, and she never smiled. Well, um. So anyway, my first week in that job, you know. I one day I'd be asking Mary a lot of questions, you know, like how does the company do this? How does the company do that? I was just trying to get, I was getting the ropes of, you know, trying to like do my best to learn there. One day um, Mary was shouting at me, um, you can't keep asking me these questions. You're supposed to be able to do this job. That's why we hired you. You can't keep asking me these questions, Mary. Mary, me. So, I was very shocked though when she shouted at me. But I responded, ah, ah, Mary, Mary, it is my first week in this job. And you know things that I do not know, that I would like to know. And if I don't feel safe asking you these questions, I'm going to make a mistake. And if I make a mistake, it's going to cost this company a lot of money. So I should be able to ask you these questions so I can do my job and learn the job better. And you should be willing to answer my questions because you're my boss and you should want me to learn this job. You should want me to do my best. Reasonable, eh? <laughs> Mary started crying. <laughs> and then everybody in the department was now looking at me. And now, now the good girl who has come from Nigeria, uh, who, has mo who her mother has raised to be a good wife and a good girl, was now the bad girl who made Irish people cry. <laughs> the managing director, he called me into his office and asked me to explain. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. I think I see the problem here. Yes, so, yeah, in Ireland, we don't, we're not that direct, you know. If you have a problem here yeah, with Mary, just come to me next time, yeah? Okay, so this was confusing me. Why would I talk to him when I could just talk to Mary? <laughs> <laughs> it's better this way. If you have a problem with Mary, you have to get through to me. Okay. Hmm. Um, so after all that in the end anyway Mary and I actually became quite good friends allies even I could ask Mary any question I think maybe in, in a way um, I released her by being so direct with her at that time um, well you know maybe Mary was just having a bad day that week maybe having nice jackets and nice suits and the house on the south side wasn't all that it's cracked up to be. Mm. Anyway, the woman who came to my house that day, I wasn't sure, I wasn't really sure what 
the woman with the notebook when she came to my house, what she was really after, um, when she when she asked me to tell her one of my stories or a few stories. Maybe she was looking for the kind of story where people, you know, start again. Because I did start again. Um, I, I'm in Nigeria, uh, for example. After, well, before Nigeria, um, after like a few years working in Ireland and finally getting an Irish experience and being one of those women with the suits and the jackets, um, it was no longer enough for me personally. I wanted to do more. Um, to work in my community and give more. Um, so, in um, what was the place again now called? Uh, when I had, oh yes, I started my when I set up my first charity in Ireland, where I was working with asylum seekers in the community. Eventually, now I run my own company now, where I teach other companies how to work with an ethnically diverse team. Uh, I teach them how to engage with their ethnically diverse colleagues so that they can value who they are as well. Um, I remember when I was in a young girl in Nigeria and I would pass someone begging in the streets and I couldn't just leave them and walk away like that. So I begged my mother, like, please give them some money. Uh -uh. She'd give them, but she, she never really, she never always thanked me for it, my mother. But it was who I was. And after all these years now living in Ireland, from all the way from the other side of the world, it's still who I am. Um, and for the, my three beautiful girls who are the reason I even came to Ireland in the first place, and took that taxi driver and lived in Navan. They're all grown up now. Um, one is, what is it? One is fifteen, and she sorry no one is thirteen and she loves cooking. The other is fifteen and she wants to go and live in Spain. And my eldest, she's seventeen and she's brilliant at rugby. Maybe she could play for Ireland someday. Mm. Maybe she'll play for Ireland someday. But then, um, the woman who... Eventually I wanted to... Oh, the woman who was still my... Uh, who came to my house with her notebook. And I was still trying to figure out what kind of story she wanted me to tell. At this point anyway, where I was in Ireland in my life, I, I wanted to go back to Africa. Finally again. And I actually went back recently. I went to a women's conference there and met up with a charity that works with girls who have VVF. VVF is uh, vesicle vaginal fistulas. The vesicle vaginal fistulas, it's a kind of, it's a common condition in Nigeria now. It's where very young girls of 12, 13 years old are married off. And because they're still so young, their bodies is still too underdeveloped to have babies. And because these girls, and once they get married, they usually give birth at home. Their wombs tear and there's no one in the house to fix it. And what happens is the tears eventually get infected and the girl starts to smell. These girls are then ostracized from their communities in shame. Their house is somewhere far away so nobody will see them again. So what this charity does is they help these girls with the VVF with an operation so that their wounds uh, starts to heal. Um, but also they, they also help them actually with um, teaching them new skills like how to sew and make bags and purses. And uh, they also teach these girls how to pass on, how to teach these skills to other girls, other friends of theirs, so that those girls can set up their own businesses in the future and become entrepreneurs. And then these, you know, these, these baby girls who were called disgusting and called smelly and told that they'll never find anyone again. They're finally able to make something beautiful with their hands. I'd love to 
bring some of those bags that those young girls have made to Ireland. I would love to see the businesswoman that I see on Pembroke Street go to the bank. I'd love to see them carry one of the bags made by these young girls. If actually, in fact, I'd love to see all women in, in conferences in Ireland and other countries to be carrying the bags made by all these different girls. You know, I'd love to bring something from there over to here. Something that's beautiful and does good. Hmm. But that's another story. A woman came to my house with a notebook and said that she wanted me to tell her my story. The woman came to my house with a notebook and said that she wanted me to tell her my story. Hey, the woman in the red coat with a notebook came to my house and said that she wanted me to tell her my story. And said that she wanted me to tell her my story. The green, the the woman with her green notebook. You know, when she came to my house, she was writing down all the stories that I was telling her. She might not have written down or understood exactly what I was trying to tell her. You know, the woman with the green notebook, she might have picked up on the details, some details incorrectly, gotten some details wrong. But I still let her in my house and I told her some of my stories. Not all. Not all. I have too many stories to tell. The end.